everybody. Welcome back to a great edition of Wrestling with the Future. I'm your host, Psychic Medium Angelo, joined tonight by my co-host, Dan the Man Sebastiano. Dan, how you doing, brother? I'm great tonight, Angelo. How are you? I'm better than average. All right. Is that good enough for you? Hey, it's the best you can ask for on some days. Baby, if I was any better, there'd be two of me. <laughs> joined tonight by Mike the... Filmmaker, movie maker, documentarian, actor, producer, writer, director. What the hell else don't you do, Mikey? I'm an Mike acting Messier. coach. Uh, I run a Avalonia Film Festival, but most importantly, Angelo, uh, the Life Lessons podcast, video cast, which people can see on the Wrestling with the Future YouTube channel. Hopefully, everyone subscribes. Absolutely, and if his name was a website, it would be MikeMessier.com. <laughs> and you. we're joined by a new panelist tonight, a guy who. Uh, I came across and uh, had an immediate connection with. His name is Mike Schroeder, but people know him far and wide as Tombstone Jesus. He's with Devotion Championship Wrestling in Salt Lake City, Utah. Mike, or I should say Tombstone, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, happy to be here, guys. Can't tell you how happy I am to be here. My gym opened yesterday. You couldn't see a happier guy than this right now. Get to speak to one of my heroes. Oh, my goodness. Here we go, brother. Well, here we go is right, brother. We got a, uh, without further ado, we're going to forego all of our usual formalities tonight. <clears throat> and we're just going to bring in our guest. Magnum TA received the Luthez Heavyweight Championship Award. The award is given to an individual in wrestling who has taken the skills of the sport into the realm of public service. Allen began his career competing in championship wrestling from Florida, Mid-South Wrestling, before becoming a nationally known household word in Jim Crockett Promotions. He worked behind the scenes at Jim Crockett and World Championship Wrestling and inspired millions by overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds after a debilitating injury. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only, Magnum TA. Terry, welcome to Wrestling man, of the Future. Man, how do, how do I follow that intro, guys? That, that was uh, awesome. I'm, 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 I'm glad to be here. Well, brother, I'm going to tell you something. You are, uh, you are among your friends and your peers, and we love you. And we are so happy to hear your voice. Well, thank you, guys. It's a pleasure. I'm glad we were able to pull this together with all the... Uh, trials and tribulations going on around the world. It's, uh, it's remarkable, remarkable to be able to escape for a few minutes back to uh, a, a much more pleasant time in life. Amen. You know, I made a prediction a, a few weeks back, Terry. I said uh, coronavirus is no match for the world of professional wrestling. Wrestling, in fact, will save us from the dreaded COVID-19. And I stand by that statement, and uh, I will be proven right here in about four weeks. There you go. Dan, why are you laughing at me? Oh, no, I was laughing. I was saying uh, that's funny to think about that of, of everything to be a salvation, it'd be wrestling. Think of the one, the one company, the one company that would unlikely to be given essential status was a wrestling company. <laughs> Right. Well, they, they they gave Florida 18 million reasons to call them essential. Absolutely. Well, normally I would be the first question out, Magnum, but I got a, a very special guest here tonight. He is an independent worker. He is with Devotion Championship Wrestling in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Tombstone Jesus. Tombstone, it's all yours. You get the first question from Magnum T.A. Thank you, Magnum, Terry Allen, sir. It is a pleasure. Uh, pleasure is all mine. I'm, I'm, I'm always glad to, to uh, intermingle with uh, folks that share the passion for, for what we did so many years ago. I'll tell you, I, I, uh, I was born in 1970. I was just a huge, huge fan. I, I got a chance to become a wrestler a little later in life, and I took it. Uh, but growing up, um, I mean, I don't know if you can see me right now or not, uh, but you were a huge influence in myself. And uh, in the ring and, and 
in arenas, people come up to me all the time and, and they say, hey, Magnum TA. And I says, yeah, I wish, you know. And Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So, I got to interrupt you, know, you there, too, for, for just a second, because uh, Magnum, I got to tell you, he looks an awful lot like you, brother. It's scary. <laughs> really? I wish I, I well, I'll have to go back and watch this. I'm sorry I couldn't join you guys uh, via video, but uh, I, I look forward to seeing it. You know, it's funny because I was just, I was, I was flipping through my phone waiting for you guys, and I saw an old picture of Scott Hall when uh, Scott was young and and doing the Magnum Scott Hall gimmick. I don't know if you guys even remember that. Yeah, uh, he looked. Oh yeah. He looked like a a giant version of me, and it was oh, just yeah. so funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was going to bring he, he, that up, you know. And yeah. That, that kind of leads into my question. So, um, like I say, for me being a young kid, um, you know, I was inspired by comic books. And then I saw wrestling. And then I saw real-life superheroes. And it was the first time I'd seen men with physiques. And, uh, you know, I know you were somewhat of a fan when you were young. And, and my question is, you know, I, I look to you. Um, you know, I, uh, there was a few guys that kind of had that look, but, but nobody brought it together like you did as far as, as, uh, having that look, but being that fit, um, you have the size, you could believably take on anybody, have a big, good match with a, a huge monster or, or, uh, a, a, a quick guy, you know, I mean, you could just bring it all together. And that look you had, it kind of come out of the 70s. And when I was a kid, I was adopted, you guys. So I had no idea what I was going to look like when I grew up. But I goddamn for sure wanted to have hair on my chest. You know what I mean? And, and it was because of guys that were just studs like Magnum. And uh, just what, what, what influenced you, you know, when you were a kid? Because... I, I don't know if there's many wrestlers that really kind of had that look. That look kind of come out of the 70s. But but uh, who inspired yeah. you when you were younger? Well, you know, I grew, you know, like you said, I, I, was born in, I was born in 1959. So I grew up, you know, with Cowboys and John Wayne and Clint Eastwood and Charles Bronson and, and you know, tough, tough good guys, you know, that were right. uh, a, a different mold. And... And and then you know then you sprinkle you know Bruce Lee came in the scene in the, in the like 1971 72 and by the time I knew who he was he was already dead but uh, but those kind of people influenced me as far as the the you know the the good guys that I grew up watching in the westerns and and the different different things and all the Clint Eastwood movies that I like. So much when I was a kid, and and I watched wrestling from the time I was about earliest memories I have of of watching TV with my dad. I was like six, seven years old, and and we'd watch Mid Atlantic Championship Wrestling because I grew up in Chesapeake, Virginia, and and I remember watching those guys and you know thinking you know how yeah you know, I was I was all enthused about it, and of course I was into the you know the the superheroes of the day were back then were Batman and the Green Hornet and stuff like that. And as I, as I got older and, and, and got involved in athletics, uh, which was for me, amateur wrestling, I started seeing that I, you know, was having an opportunity to build a physique because there was nobody in my family that was great big. My dad was a big man. He was six foot two, but he was a basketball player in high school. And he, he wasn't, you know, like a, a muscle head kind of guy or anything. And when I remember vividly the first time I saw guys like Ricky Steamboat and Jimmy Snuka uh, wrestle, I said, oh, my gosh. I said, this is, you know, these guys look like athletes. They, they look like superhumans, and yeah, they can absolutely. do all these amazing things. And, and, and it inspired me because I knew, you know, nobody can make yourself taller. I mean, I'm six foot two. And, uh, you know, you're not going to be six foot nine Black Jack Mulligan or seven foot two Andre the Giant, but you can make whatever you've got the best version of you if you work hard enough at it. And that's Absolutely. what I did. I, you know, I, I, I found 
a place where I was comfortable when I, when I was in my you know best shape that people remember me in from 85 86 I weighed about 242 pounds oh, yeah. and um and, yeah. and 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 I was in the ring with guys like you said that you know I was bigger than Flair but I was sure. Uh, but but Nikita was you know two eighty five two ninety when him and yeah. I were you know starting oh, yeah. our deal he he was humongous and animal oh yeah and we're going to talk you know. about Nikita oh, oh yeah, yeah. And, 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 oh yeah and 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 so you know when you're in the ring with guys that are thirty and forty and sometimes you know fifty pounds bigger than you the average guy on the street that watches you wrestle on television has no idea how big you really are. Oh, sure. you know, and the and the funniest thing was always to me running into guys on the street in a nightclub in a restaurant something and they would be like you know just freaked out because they thought i was a giant when they got yeah. eyeball to eyeball with me and they're looking up and they're about a buck 75 you know and they're, they're going oh my gosh and they said how do you get so big i said no I said, I'm, I'm always been like this. I said, you're just used to seeing me in the ring with 300 pound men. Yeah. And I said that, you know, you know, well, and, and um, anybody I'm that looks a little. That. I was actually going to chime in on that, Terry. You know, I, I, the first time I saw you uh, live was at the uh, Philadelphia Civic Center. I've seen you there several times. And, you know, you, you're telling everyone you're six foot two, but I got to tell you something, brother. You come across like, you know, a guy that's six, seven, six, eight. I mean, you, you come off like a big guy. Well, um, I, was I, good, I was pretty good size. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> you sure are. But you know, the, the, uh, the whole Magnum thing, you know, back in the day, there was a, a Tom Selleck show called Magnum PI. How immediately, yeah. how immediately did you, uh, did, did, was the comparison made to, to you and Tom Selleck? Well, so I got to I got to go back in time here for a minute for you. So I actually broke in in Portland, Oregon for Don Owens. Oh, sure. In 19 in 1980. Yeah. And I had a big Olds 98 four door uh, car. And when whoever had the biggest car, when Andre came in town, you drove the giant around. So I'm a rookie. 1980. I've just just started and I meet Andre the giant for the first time. And we, oh, wow. and he's in, he's in our, he's in, in the territory for, I don't remember if it was for 10 days or two weeks or whatever, but we ride together every day and I drive him to and from, we become friends. And then I don't see him again for, let's see, I guess about a year and a half. So I had just broke in January of eight, 1980. And then I see him again, and then I, I worked six months in, in Portland for Don, and then I went to work for Joe Blanchard and uh, in his territory there in San Antonio, there for six months, right. and I met Mike Graham. Mike Graham had come in as a junior heavyweight champion of the world. Him and I met and hit it off like we were like brothers, like we'd known each other our entire life. Yeah. He went home, told his daddy, he said, I got this guy you got to see. He said, "You, we got to, you got to, we got to bring him to Florida. He is made for Florida. Go to Florida, and that's where I really start to get comfortable in my own skin a little bit and yeah. doing my thing. And after I'd been there about, I don't know, probably eight nine months, and was really getting a lot of ring time. A lot, I mean, and when I say ring time, I mean Dusty had me had." Uh, me out there with Brad Armstrong and, and or Scott McGee is my partner, and we're going 45 minute broadways every night. Oh wow! With the Royal Kanger, with the Royal Kangaroos, so I'm getting ring oh, time, ring God. time, ring time, and I've got I've got you know I, I, I've got people in my ear, you know, mentoring me, talking to me, you know, telling me, you know, I got Eddie Graham who's like a mastermind of psychology. Not only talking to me about what I did, but he, he, I stand out there and watch all the matches with him, and he's telling me what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what you don't do, how you paint a picture, how you do this, how you tell the story. He's, I mean, he's giving me a master's class in yeah. working every every night. So, 
I, here comes again Andre. Andre comes into town, and he hasn't seen me in a year and a half. Well, I've matured drastically because he, when he first saw me, I'd had three matches. <laughs> you know, now I've had five hundred plus matches. Sure. And, and he and 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 him and I are sitting in a uh, a place called Fat Man's Barbecue down in in Florida, having mm -hmm. breakfast about like at three o'clock in the morning. And he looks across the table at me and he says, "You know," he said. You're 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 destined like you're you're onto something here. He said, but you need a handle. That was a word he used, like a handle, like a CB guy on the handle needed a handle. And he yeah. said, you look like that guy on TV. And I had shorter hair back then, but but blonde, but the, and the short mustache. And and he said, you look like that guy Magnum on the show. He said, you should be Magnum TA. And he came up with it just right out of his mouth. Boom. He said, That's no what you kidding. Be. So he so was, was going Andre. back. Yeah, Andre gave me the name, and That's Andre was amazing. going back, back to back to New York to Vince Senior because he wanted to bring me to the WWF yeah. uh, as Mag as Magnum TA. Whoa. And as fate would have it, Ernie Ladd was also coming in and out of Florida, and and is and has been eyeballing me and and. I get a call from Ernie in the middle of the night because this young fellow named Paul Orndorff, he was a top top star there in in, sure. in mid south, had up and left 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 Bill high and dry, and, and gone to work for the WWF. Yeah. Right? So opened up this spot. Ernie makes a call. He said, "How would you like a chance to work on top and be a star?" And uh, so before. Andre could work his magic. I get the call to go to uh, to work for Bill, and I go there, and that's where I assume I assume the name. But I don't know what the name means yet. I don't know what my character is going to be. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what this is all going to be about yet because I'm still because now I've gone from working in the middle of the card and I mean we'd have the tag team straps and different things like that but I'd never work singles main event anything let alone angles and all the things that go along with it sure so, so now I've been in the business a total of let's see two and a half years and I end up there in mid-south and with the name Magnum TA and somebody put a rock around your neck and jump in and say figure out how to swim <laughs> oh dear Jesus, that's crazy. Yeah. That that's crazy. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. You, you mentioned a few names there that I, I don't want. Uh, I don't want them to go by the wayside. I want to keep uh, keep those names alive and keep their history alive too. Um, you mentioned Mike and Eddie Graham. Um, I never met Eddie. I had the chance to meet Mike. Um, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Neither is is Eddie. Is is the genius of Eddie Graham, Terry, is it overstated or is it really understated? I have heard stories about this guy being able to pull an idea out of thin air and make it magic. Was he really that good? He was better than that. Really? Yeah. What was, yeah, what he, was his secret? He, what, he, was his, what was his magic? Well, what did well, he know that he, nobody he, else did? Well, he knows he knew the formula, and the formula is simplistic, but it but it's about how to tell a story. And he could see in people what they were capable of, even when they weren't capable of doing it themselves. Ah, but he okay. he but he instilled the basics of how you tell a story and he's the one that taught bill watts bill learned his his whole game plan for the business from from eddie and and, and bill was, was in you know a, 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 another highly intelligent man in and of himself but he sure. learned it from eddie and the thing yeah. was this and he told eddie told me from the very beginning he said no matter how big a star you get to be every night you go to the ring you always reestablish who you are as if they have never seen you before ever. 
You yeah. always stay true to what you are. And if a if a heel can out wrestle and out fight a baby face, then there's no reason for him to be a heel. Sure. No reason. No reason. Absolutely. If if, if, if stand up toe to toe brawl, if if he can just whoop your ass, then there's no need in him being a heel because he will ultimately end up being the baby face because he's done nothing but prove dominance, and that doesn't make a heel. That's yeah, a great a, a segue. Heel. That's a really great segue. You mentioned feeling comfortable in your own skin there, you know, getting, getting a feel for who you are. So at what point is the decision made to turn you baby-faced? And well, I was, I was, I was never, well, I was never a heel. I never, I never worked heel one day in my life. I, I know, and there, I was going to go there actually because yes. from what I heard, that was the initial idea was to have you as this pretty boy looking heel. That and and that Jim Ross may have told you that, and uh, and actually, that was yeah. and, 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 yeah. Actually, yeah. and and that was Bill's idea, which he had never run by me ever, uh, right. but he would have probably tried to sell it. But Jim said, "You're crazy. Look at this guy." Why in the world would you want to do that to what he can bring to the dance uh, in this other role? And and with all my influence of, of people that I had idolized, I mean, the, the characters that I, that I wanted to be able to portray, like Dirty Harry was, and like John Wayne was, and like Charles Bronson, they weren't, you know, they weren't wimpy little, you know, cutesy, fancy pants guys, they were tough guys. Right. Sure. And, 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 and they would get in, they would, they would get in situations where they had to fight back from the bottom up, but Absolutely. they always stayed true to a character. And that's what I dug my heels in to do yeah. because I was honestly was, <sighs> believe it or not, and this, I mean, and if you really, really look back on me, I was really the attitude before the era. Well, you know, I was going to go there, uh, Magnum, because I'm going to tell you what, you were clearly a baby face, but you were a baby face with a big chip on your shoulder and an attitude bigger than you were. And, and that's what I, and that's what, and that's why I was, you know, I was comfortable in that. And it wasn't a stretch yeah. and it was, it was. Uh, you know, because, and for me, because I was most of the time in there with some monster, Yeah, uh, it was a, it was an easy role to play. And i also come from this background of fighting in bars and being a bouncer and, and yeah. working security and, and working with guys that, you know, were former SEAL Team 6 guys that taught me, you know, all kind of things when I worked in Virginia Beach. And oh, so sure. I, mean, I, I, had, I had this package that... Yeah. On the surface, people didn't, you know, really know, but where I was, where I was eventually going to take this whole thing would have blown everybody's mind. Yeah. If it had, if it had all gotten to play out, but that's why it was so calculated the way things unfolded in the way yeah. things were happening. Terry, uh, we got a question from uh, our resident filmmaker. This gentleman is an actor, director, producer, writer. He shared the screen with uh, Meryl Streep, Sybil Shepard, Wesley Snipes. His name is Mike Messier, and he's got a question for you. Hi, Magnum. It's uh, great to talk to you again. We were just talking before the show started. And um, today I watched a match of you in Florida against Kevin Sullivan. And what came up during that match was the way that you would stand when the two wrestlers were kind of squaring off in between, you know, uh, sequence of moves you stood in a very particular way with kind of your hands clenched and almost the the veins of your neck bulging out as if you were just tense and about to fight somebody and magnum i remember that from you know the tully blanchard matches the wahoo matches the flair nikita matches but it's just something that seemed to be in your style from the get-go and it really is a very realistic uh, fight stance that I don't think I can't think of any other wrestler, even the Road Warriors or Bruiser Brody would would have something 
so intense when you're just standing across the ring from a guy? Was that something you did naturally or was that a deliberate thought? No, it was it, it was it was the most natural thing that that um, it, it just came out because I, I had I had fought my way from the bottom up in every aspect of everything that I had done to get to the point to where you saw me. Uh, when I was in the ninth grade, I couldn't do a push up. When I was a senior in high school, I could do 100 push ups and I pinned everybody I wrestled in the state tournament. I, I was the guy, I wasn't the natural athlete. I was the guy that had to fight tooth and nail from the bottom year round, seven days a week to get where I, I ultimately got to. And my yeah. mom and dad taught me that if you believed it and you could dream it and you were really willing to put in the work, you could achieve it. And Absolutely. I believed it and I worked and I pushed and I pulled and I fought and I scrapped. And when when I walked in that ring, I could flick a switch. I could turn it on and it just was the most natural feeling thing for me from the get go, from the very first match. My very first match I ever had in my whole career was with Buzz Sawyer on TV for Don Owens. And for I'd sure. only been in the ring at, I'd only been in the ring and worked out one time for two hours. That's not in the in, <laughs> that's, and, and then that's went on live TV. That's yeah. insane, brother. That is absolutely crazy. <laughs> Buzz yeah, Sawyer was nuts. known for Buzz Sawyer was known for being uh, just a, a, a tough guy. A guy oh, yeah. that was was not particularly well liked with the other wrestlers. Uh, even the Undertaker had a bad experience. Was he rough with yeah. you, Magnum, or did the match go okay? No, from your memory? because because I could take care of myself any any way you wanted to go. You could be easy. It could be easy, <laughs> or it could not be easy. I mean, I yeah. It, it, I, I, I and honest, I, I can honestly say that that in in the thousands of matches that I had. I, I never had anybody ever, it, it was even remotely physically intimidating to me in the ring. Amazing. Because I was just, I, because it, the, I was just so, as you said, I was so wired for sound that it was like the fuse was ready to go. <laughs> so we're going to either work and we're going to dance or it can go the other way. It could have gone any, any way you wanted it to go. It really didn't matter. I was there and ready to go and, and wanted to have a good time. But if you didn't want to have a good time, then we could go that way too. Absolutely. Our next question comes from my co-host, uh, who comes to us by way of the United States Navy, Dan the Man Sebastiano. Magnum, how are you? I'm doing great. I just want to say uh, I'm a huge fan. I'm actually from uh, well in Norfolk right now, and uh, you are still a huge name in all the wrestling discussions out here. So it's a huge honor to talk to you. Why don't you no, tell me you. what you did, smartass? Oh, um, the guys were getting a kick, uh, researching, getting ready for the show. I happened to get in touch with the Norfolk Collegiate School. And uh -huh. due to, uh, due to a uh, simple email, I just got, I got you added to their notable alumni page. So big name in the uh -oh. area. I figured it was worth it. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, the, the, uh, I've got great memories there. Uh, we, I was part of the charter wrestling team, the very first wrestling team. Mm -hmm. That they had at the school, and uh, my like I said, my senior year, uh, you know, we our our whole our team as a whole, I think we took third and second or third in the state as a team, and had uh, you know mul multiple state champions and runners up and everything else. So it was uh, quite an alumni. I'm sure. I'm sure. Tombstone, you're yeah. you're 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 back at bat, brother. Am I up? Do I get another question? Yes, sir. Oh, boy. Hey, Magnum, um, did you ever get a chance to work with Billy Jack when you were in uh, Oregon? That's another guy I really, really was fond of. Uh, Billy uh, and I didn't even meet when I was in Portland, but he came to work for the Crockett's uh, in sometime in 86 before he went to New York. And I actually did some six man tag team stuff with him, uh, with Dusty and I and him, uh, when we were trying to get him over and, you know, push him. 
uh, and he is super guy. I mean, I, I just saw, I just saw Billy, uh, this last year I did a show up in, oh gosh, in, in Philadelphia at that famous arena there where they had the hardcore wrestling. And, ECW uh, arena. Yeah. Yeah. ECW arena. And, uh, that was and, my and home that, away from home for a long time, brother. <laughs> yeah. So Billy was there and that's the first time him and I had seen each other in uh, 30 plus years. And we sat down and reminisced and, uh, had a good time. Were you well, guys I tell you close what, speak the same size, Magnum, or, or uh, was Billy a little taller, a little huskier? Billy was probably six four. I'd say he's two inches taller than me, and he probably weighed. Mm, he he was a good twenty to thirty pounds bigger than me. Um, right. The I tell you the funny story. So when when I was in San Antonio. And and uh, Ray Hernandez came in from Florida, and we were both young, you know, young rookies. Uh, Tom Pritchard was there, Manny Fernandez was there, Scott Casey. Um, oh my God! The, the, like the, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, Tank Patton and and you know Buck Robley and just you know it's just a crazy, oh, wow. fun place to be. And we anyway, and so in comes. In comes Ray, and Ray and I hit it off. And Ray has got a grocery bag literally full of performance-enhancing elements, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, a grocery bag, great big brown bag full, too. I mean, like spilling over. And and so him and I start training together, and he's and he's showing me his, his super vitamins. And in a matter of weeks, all of a sudden, him and I are morphing into this like craziness, and I got up and I got up to I was like two thirty when we started, and all of a sudden I'm two seventy three, and I'm going like oh, and yeah. I'm going to the moon, right? I mean, my arms were my arm hanging down by my side was nineteen inches, Jesus. and and I'm and I've got it in my head that I'm going to be three hundred pounds. I'm going to be bigger than the Road Warriors. I mean, I'm just like I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 20, you know, 22 years old, you know, think I'm Superman, and so I walk in this, I walk in this dressing room in Corpus Christi, and there sits Bruiser Brody, and Brody says, "Kid, you look amazing," and he said, "Man, I can't believe how you look," and then he, but then he says, "But I want to tell you something," he said, "If you become a star." based on what, how big you are, and you have to do all this stuff to maintain that size, you're going to write your own epitaph right there. Yeah. Because it will, kill, it will kill you. And a light switch went off in my head right then and there, and I said, you know what? I'm going to find out what size I can be that I can maintain safely, and I can still wrestle 60 minutes, and I can still run, and I can still be athletic, and I can still be strong. And I found out I could maintain 240 pounds without being a roid head. And and he changed my he changed and he changed and he changed the whole course of my image of what I wanted to be. And I told his that's widow remarkable when, when when I saw her uh, at at the when I got that Lutez Award in in uh, uh, Waterloo, Iowa. I told yeah. her that story because I mean he. He he changed the course of my thinking at a very young age yeah. in the business, and I could have just as easily gone down a path of, of just to be a statistic of another one with a enlarged heart and, right, and gone sure. in their sleep. You know, oh, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, well, and I tell you said, what, learn, you know, learn she, the craft. she's been on the show with us. Barbara was actually here a couple of weeks ago, and. Uh, and, you know, we, we did an episode on Bruiser. Um, wonderful woman. She's coming back. We also had a woman on last week who spoke very highly of you, young man. Um, somebody you're familiar with, Karen McDaniel, Wahoo's wife. Ah, man, she's, she's a sweetheart. And, and she's the Karen. You know, what, an, what an honor, to, what an honor to, to have got the opportunity to have you know, what I consider his last big main event match. Well, match. we're going to talk about that. Um, I actually watched that today. 
Um, I watched a cage match with uh, yourself and Wahoo. And it's interesting because, like you, Wahoo uh, was a babyface. Right. And wasn't very comfortable wrestling heel. In fact, the Karen told us that he, in fact, Mike Messier, you were on the show with us. I remember, uh, yes. That he, he hated wrestling heel because yeah. he personally, and this is interesting, and I'm going to talk about it. It's that he personally didn't like not being liked in real life. He, he didn't like the heat that he got from the fans in real life. Has that mm-hmm. ever spilled over into your life where people saw you as such a baby face that they just they had to be with you? They had to be near you? Um, maybe an obsessive fan that just, for whatever reason, felt like you were like, they're it, they're all? I was so on, um, you know, this meteor meteor type ride and in and out and and working seven days a week sometimes 10 and 12 different matches a week you know with with afternoon shows and everything i was never in a place long enough at one time for that to be an issue okay literally literally i mean i would go as many as 90 and 100 days without even taking the day off yeah so Life for me was, you know, on the road, trying to get workouts in, hit, you know, making the towns, making the, you know, you know, trying to have the best match I could possibly have, and and, and you know, it was blessed to be able to main event for, you know, the last four years of of, of a career that was, you know, just something like out of some out of a storybook. Yeah. And, I mean, I mean, he graduates high school in 1977, and in 1985 is selling out their hometown arena in Norfolk Scope, wrestling for the yeah. world's heavyweight title with Ric Flair. What, in what world does that happen? I mean, yeah, you know, that, I'll like tell that you what, happen. brother, they struck a, a rocket to your ass, and you took a ride. I mean, you <laughs> I, took I a, a meteoric ride. Um, you mentioned a few names there that are actually pretty good friends of the show. Scott Casey is a dear friend of mine. Manny Fernandez, uh, he's been on the show two or three times already. Scott has been on the show probably three or four times. Um, Cowboy Johnny Mantel, uh, guys like that. You worked with all these guys, but uh, the one person we had on that spoke super highly of you and put you over to the moon was my dear friend, in fact, the woman who hooked you and I up, my friend Nicola, Baby Doll. What do you remember about Baby Doll? Uh, she she was just, uh, you know, she was a diamond in the rough discovery for, uh, you know, for the Crockett's to bring her in in the role that she did. And she just had this photogenic uh, charisma about her that was, uh, uh you know, I mean, she honestly, she was the first to me, uh, aside from Elizabeth, because I, I love Liz and and you know what she did with Randy. But Baby Doll broke all the moles. I mean, here's yeah. Baby Doll, you know, a statuesque, you know, larger woman, a- athlete in high school, uh, strong, uh, and you know. All the, you know, first off, she's just, you know, there, they, there's just this thing that we're, it's going to happen with, with Tully. And then she takes it, you know, on her own with the Crockett's yeah. push to a whole nother level. And, uh, uh, you know, she just, you know, made a real mark in, yeah. in the history books of, of the business. And, uh, you know, like, yeah, you know, just, just per se. I mean, have you ever stood down on the floor? And looked up at a steel cage, you know how, how they really go up in the air. Sure, when you're down on the floor, and she slung a, a solid wood folding chair over the top of that cage like she was throwing a, sh- a shoe. And I'm telling you, that takes some strength. Sure. Well, the she average talk- person couldn't do couldn't do it. Sure. 
I know Dan the man is chomping at the bit to ask you about the uh, the Tully Blanchard I quit match. So go ahead, Dan. Stop squirming. Man, is that obvious? Um, I mentioned being a big fan. One of the tapes I wore out when I was younger was the best of, and it had that you and Tully on it. I'm, I was hoping you could expand on, um, you mentioned, you talked about the meteoric rise, and you talked about how relatively new the Magnum TA character was. How does that conversation go? Somebody, maybe new's not the better, not the best word, but, but somebody in your position to be put in a feud with the horseman. How does that conversation come about? Well, I mean, the deal was, was this. I mean, I was being pushed for the world title. There was no if, ands, or buts about it. Um, and that was the goal. That was the plan. I was 27 years old. They wanted me to be, uh, you know, at that time, like the youngest world's heavyweight champion. And uh, because Flair is 10 years older than I am, and believe this or not, the, at the Crockett's back in, in 1985, thought that he was too old to be representing wrestling as the world's heavyweight champion. In 85? Little did in 85. they know. In 85. Yeah, in 85. They wanted to make, they wanted Rick around. They wanted Rick in the game, but they wanted Rick to be like a Jack Nicholas type like figure. And they yeah, wanted like a youth basketball. movement. Yeah. Kind of yeah, the elder they, they, seriously, Yeah, well, that's seriously, you know, and you know, for whatever reason, that was their thought process. Yeah. So I was brought in with that in mind from the get-go. And we that's why when we got on the Superstation, uh, the very first thing they did was let Rick and I go all around the horn. Yeah. And we wrestled our Broadway all the way in every every major city across the United States. He and I wrestled 19 hour Broadways in one month. Terry, stop there for just a second. I want you to give some some idea to people of what it's like to go an hour Broadway 15, 20 days in a row with a guy that's got the stamina of someone like Ric Flair who can just go. Give us a little insight into what that's like. Well, if you're not... <laughs> If you're not worth your mustard, you would find out very quickly because you've got to be able, you've got to be able to dance the dance and and keep up with the man and and it, it's funny. So I mean, I, in in the in the Crockett world, in the NWA, I have this battle feud with with Wahoo that concludes with me winning the title. I do this round the world loop with with Rick to establish that we, the NWA, are a fighting sports commodity unlike what we were competing against at the time with the WWE. Yeah. You got Hogan coming out, you know, with a 20-minute entrance and exit in a five-minute match, and yeah. we're right up the street in another sold-out building going an hour. So we were trying to paint the picture and tell the story that we were – competitive, hard-hitting, brutal combat sport wrestling. They were entertainment wrestling, two different worlds. And with Rick, it was, it was, uh, honestly, for me, it it was, it was, it was, it wasn't a hard thing. It was an education thing. I was learning from him just like, I did wrestling with Mr. Wrestling 2, with Ted DiBiase, yeah. with Ernie Ladd, with, with Hacksaw Butch Reed. I was always learning, 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 learning from every single body I could soak it up like a sponge with because yeah. I knew one day that I would be the guy leading the dance, not following the dance. And to lead the dance, you've got to be able to do it all. And you've got to be able yeah. to do it with anybody. And that's what the world's champion had to be able to do because you had to be able to go and wrestle anybody's champion and tell the story, come out of right. there, still the world champion, and but make that other person in the process to where it was a win-win for everybody. You brought everybody oh, stock up when you when yeah. you came to town, and that's what I was honing my craft to be able to, you know. I mean, they weren't looking for me to be a two-week wonder. They were looking for me to have a year, two-year run 
with right. the belt and then and then be in programs back and forth with it. So, it, you know, it, it was what I was working towards. And the the test of that was my program with Nikita. So yeah. with Nikita was the first time that I was the veteran. I was the leader. He had a he had a great leader on the outside and, and Ivan, but Ivan could yeah. only do so much from the side. Sure. And so for me, the measuring stick, which nobody understood, of course, on the outside, because this was before Keith Abe was broke. Yeah. But, you know, they see me in the battle with the evil Russian. But for me, that was my graduate course of saying, yep, I'm ready. Because yeah, absolutely. Nick and I were going out there and going 30 minutes, 45 minutes and tearing the house down. And absolutely. I was leading those matches and I was leading those matches. I was generaling the matches and I felt comfortable in that role. And that's yeah. when I knew I was, re I was ready. Got a question for you. Then I'm going to turn it over to Mike Messier. Um, how influential was Dusty Rhodes in your development? In my development, in that when I was in Florida, he and I traveled together every day. And so okay. he talked to me about the visions and the big, the big productions and the things. And, you know, I, I, I was, it was like riding around with Cecil B. DeMille's. I mean, he was just this bigger than life character. And, but he didn't, he didn't talk to me about philosophy. He talked to me about angles and yeah. things that we could do and things we'd cook up to do. But what Dusty did that was such a, a, a blessing for me was teaming me up with Scotty McGee and Brad Armstrong and letting us have these runs with the tag titles where we had all this time to put in matches. And Don Kent and his partner, who I can't remember for the life of me right now. Roy Heffern? Uh, yes. They, they taught me, taught me, taught me, taught me. I, I used to make Scotty so mad because I loved selling. Selling is much harder work than shining. Shining is easy. You stand there, everybody flies around for you, makes you like a million bucks. But yeah. to sell... <laughs> <laughs> to sell and not die means you have to be fighting back all the time. You're Absolutely. always fighting from the bottom up, the bottom up. And we go, and he and I would have tag matches. Then we'd go in and do our little deal and be shining for 10 minutes. And then they'd set the heat on me, and I would never tag out. I would, I would sell for 30 minutes because I loved the fight from the bottom up, and that's what Eddie taught me. So there's a difference in registering in selling and in dying you register something and it has a certain amount of effect you sell something and they see it they can feel it you pin them on it off if you die you're dead and there's no comeback and he and he taught me how to do that and and that that is what what dusty gave me the platform to put those hours in the ring to perfect that so when i got the opportunity to work yeah. the main event angles and go to mid south and be in in the matches with Butch Reed and Jim Duggan and I were tag partners and and in right. all the host of characters there Ernie Ladd you know all these guys I knew how to fight from the bottom up and sure. I could make those people feel like they were in the fight with me and that was the thing it made it all personal we had interviews directly looking at the camera we yeah. talked to you. We made you feel like you were our black like family, our blood. And then when you came and you got involved in the struggle with us and you wanted to see us overcome, and when we did, we all celebrated together. It was just a whole different era. It was magic that, when you know, did that, know that you could ever recreate. When, when did it all disappear? Why is that no longer a factor? Why is it no longer considered a part of the overall product? It just it's it seems to at least in my opinion, and Dan and I have had this debate, Terry, is that uh, it seems just like mindless action, spot after spot. There's no longer the uh, detail to psychology or having the people buy into the realism of what you're doing. 
When did we lose that? Progress. We lost it with progress. So we lost it with people like Turner Broadcasting when they uh, sat in a boardroom in the North Tower with all these people from these different networks talking about wrestling. And they said, it's so dark. They said, it's just so dark. Well, when they were saying dark, they meant literally it's dark. They didn't like a building that had a spotlight on on little insect looking people down inside of a ring with a big arena where it was all blacked out and you're doing this pantomime in the round that they didn't understand. They wanted to light the buildings up so you could see the fans, to make the yeah. fans interaction, take the focus off the off the the interaction in the ring. You know, take away the personalized yeah. interviews where you looked into that camera. When that red light came on, I was staring lightning bolts through that camera. I would daring somebody to get off their seat and not pay attention to what I had to say. I mean, yeah. that was what we had the opportunity to do. Today, they're, you know, they're looking off into space and they're standing in the middle of the ring and, and they're trying to, you know, you know, they're trying to make their own something somebody's writing for them because yeah. the art of doing a promo has somehow become, you know, something unobtainable. You're not supposed to be able to have fr your free will of saying what comes across your mind or be creative or, be anything oh well, brother i'm gonna tell you what that <laughs> we had that debate uh, on our last show uh you know uh, it, the the lost art of the promo and writers versus bookers and well i know mike messier is chomping at the bit now to ask a question go ahead mikey magnum going back to your mid-south days um you and mr wrestling too had an angle that was really ahead of its time um, he, you were kind of the protege, Mr. Wrestling too, with that famous white mask and the black trim was your mentor. You guys had a uh, feud with the Midnight Express with Jim Cornette for the, uh, Mid-South Tag Team titles. And, uh, eventually two got very aggressive with his mentoring. I think he even slapped you across the face, trying to awaken you up. Eventually, Mr. Wrestling 2 beat Junkyard Dog for the singles championship in Mid-South. And then you were off and running, you know, challenging Mr. Wrestling 2 as the baby face against uh, 2, who was the heel, which was kind of new for Mr. Wrestling 2 to be the heel. And it was just reading about that feud in the, in the Pro Wrestling Illustrated and the Sports Review Wrestlings at the time. It was really a fascinating uh, storyline to follow. Can you tell us about uh, some of the emotions or the emotional arcs and how you got the fans emotionally invested in that teacher versus student relationship with the ultimate payoff of you defeating him for the title? Yeah, and, and Bill Dundee was the mastermind for that. So I'm going to give him credit where credit's due. Uh, he, he foresaw what that could be, you know, how that could be done. And it was a story that other people have portrayed, other people have done, but never with somebody like Wrestling 2 who had never been a heel and and who had never even, you know, thought about being a heel. He'd just been a baby face forever, right? Right. So, so the, the thing that happened was that, you know, he's supposed to be, you know, like, helping coach me and teach me and bring me along and we're and we're tag team partners and and then we're the tag team champions and then you know we get into this feud with the midnight express that you know that all these things keep happening that i keep i keep coming up on the short end of the stick because of two because wrestling too something happens to him and i bear the brunt of all the problem we had the lash matches and i end up taking all the lashes because wrestling too, something happens to him and he can't, you know, we get screwed in the match. We got to take the lashes and he walks off or something. I end up taking all of them, right? Or or the deal where I got tarred and feathered, and which was a whole nother, we could talk for an hour about that whole angle. <laughs> but, but no, no, seriously, Irish McNeil's Boys Club, where we film in dead of winter, what a rib, the war, hot water heater, goes out and I have got to wash off molasses from head to toe before I can even get think about driving back home. You, it, it turned blue. Jim Nineheart stood in the shower 
making sure that I didn't like hyperventilate and fall out. But 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 all that but all that to say, two two went on this journey that he'd never been on, and he'd always been the fan favorite and everything. And the angle was that I got made the number one contender for the North American title, which which drove him insane, and that's what pushed him over the edge. And then he turns full blown heel on JYD in New Orleans, yeah. downtown building. And oh my goodness, that's just where you want to turn heel on the dog. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you just think you're a bad man if you want to try to get out of that crowd. And who'd act think they're going to beat that dog? Man, those people were live. They, they, those people were serious about JYD. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And so, so when uh, you know, two turned on him, he had the belt. I chased him for the belt. I finally beat him for the belt. Uh, it was, it was, it was a struggle in a lot of ways, not because of of anything other than the fact that Johnny just had never been a heel, and he didn't get yeah. it. He didn't. He didn't get the fact that all of a sudden, you know, he's Mister Wrestling. He's supposed to be able to out wrestle everybody, but he couldn't out wrestle me. And, yeah. and, 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 and he couldn't wrap his head around that. And unfortunately, he finally got it. He really got it and turned into a really good heel, but it was too late and Bill was pissed and pulled the plug on it. Mm. And, Amazing. And, and, I, and I was already, and I had the belt. I mean, he was like, we were in a feud back and forth and Bill just killed it, put me in an angle yeah. with Ernie and, and, uh, and, and boom, it, it was over. But incredible. Johnny, you know, Johnny, Johnny was an incredible worker because to work under a mask and be able to pantomime the things that he could do was was genius. I mean, well, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's forward, guys under a mask is, is a whole different game. Yeah, I was just, I was just actually going to go there. You know, when when you when you're covered up like that, it's got to be incredibly difficult to show your emotions. When when people can't see you, they can't see your your you know eyes squinting. You, they can't see your face writhing in pain. It's got to be incredibly yeah. difficult to to be able to pull that off effectively. Unfortunately, yeah. as as you pointed out, by the time he was able to do that, because I'm familiar with the with Johnny Walker, very familiar with him, uh, it was too late, and uh, and I don't think he ever recovered after that. To be honest with you, Terry. No, he didn't, and it's kind of sad because he was a talent and and uh, and, and and did left an amazing history in the business. And yeah, and I remember him coming to Atlanta uh, when we were on fire. I mean, we were just right. on fire, and he came and talked to Dusty, and he you know, came down to TBS where you know down at the studio, and and you know was trying to get Dusty to you know work you know let us you know, work that angle, you know, again, somehow, like on a national level. And, and, yeah. you know, of course, that that was, that ship had sailed, so, you know, was way, way far yeah. beyond that ever, take, you know, ever happened again. I felt bad for him because it, it was like he missed, he missed, he probably could have had another strong five years in the business as a heel. Yeah. Oh, that's sure. Had another, you know, another good run. And uh, Absolutely. You know, I, I hate it because I really... I really had a lot of uh, uh, respect for the man, and and uh, and we we you know, we both went through a you know quite a journey together. Oh because, yeah, uh, uh, because he 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 couldn't get it at first. He just couldn't get it, and yeah. And Bill Dundee, to his credit, Bill wouldn't let it go because Bill and I traveled together, and Bill would tell me, you know, he's not doing this right. You've got to be in command of this part of the match, this deal, how you got to get out. Bill had me so mad one time after the match, I went all the way across the building. Or it was at Shreveport and went across the building. Two was in the shower and two used to wear his, his mask into the shower because he never wanted anybody to see him without his mask. Yeah. So, and I ripped that daggone shower curtain off and he thought I was going to kill him because <laughs> I, I was so mad about it. You know, just the fact that we missed this huge opportunity because Incredible. he just didn't get it. He didn't get it. You know, Tombstone he did, he Jesus. Got it. Tombstone Jesus, you're up. Awesome. Hey, I got another question for you, Magnum. 
So, I mean, just starting out, you mentioned your first match was on TV with Buzz Sawyer. And like two days later, you're driving around in a car with Andre the Giant. Um, was it basically everyone set eyes on you and said, kid, you, you're on your way? And, and how long in your career before you, you got a strap, be it a tag belt or, or, or what? How, how, how soon was that in your career? I didn't, I didn't have any kind of title until I went got to Florida. I mean, I, 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 I mean, this is how. So when I came there, Buzz is the one that got me in the door, right? Buzz told Don that I had been working. I'd been working down in in, in Mid South for 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 Bill, like underneath, and Don never picked up the call and asked Bill. Never said a word, anything. So he lied. Again, yeah, he, he lied. lied. <laughs> and, and and so, so you know, I'm working. You know, I I had that match with with him, and then I go to work the next night. I don't even have a pair of boots. Moose Morowski gave me a pair of boots. He and he was about a size 13, and I was 11 and a half. And then <laughs> big Claude Hopper boots that he and god bless him thank him for for doing it i mean so he you know gave me my first pair of boots and i mean i was just i was just flying by the seat of my pants the barbarian had just broke in he was tonga john and him and i were about to kill each other because we were both yeah. both is i mean you, you can't even imagine how to spell stiff with the two of us out there <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to work it all out and figure it all out and uh oh, shit. but 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 the thing of it was the first time they put me in front of a camera and put a microphone in front of me i was completely at home i i never i never had a uh, fear of the camera or or expressing myself or anything like that so that was the thing I was, I was just at home uh, speaking, and the rest of it was just trying to learn the mechanics of yeah. how do you do this without killing yourself or somebody else in the process. Oh, sure. Well, I got to tell you, man, I, I truly believe you could have done anything you wanted. Gone to be an actor, whatever. You know, as a kid, I mean, we brought you guys brought up Magnum P.I., Hey, that guy was a pussy to me because of Magnum TA. <laughs> so, you know, um, exactly. guys like Magnum TA made it so I couldn't watch TV because those guys were well, pussies, you know. Well, I'll tell, I'll, tell you guys, I'll tell you guys a story. So my grand plan was I wanted to uh, – I wanted the world title, wanted my run, and I was going to retire from wrestling at 30. Oh. I didn't want to wrestle past 30. Because I'd had the opportunity to drive the Copenhagen car that Benny Parsons drove for U.S. Tobacco at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Wow. And it was the biggest rush of my entire life ever. Wow. Ever. Anything I've ever physically been able to do was drive that car. I got to drive it with nobody in it but me and two hot laps around Charlotte Motor Speedway. And three months later, I'm sitting on a, on a plane and this guy walks by, and he's got all these cool conchas on his belt. I'm trying to figure out where Dusty and I are up in first class. And he's got a cowboy hat on, and he sits down next to me, and I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. And it was Hal Needham. And oh, Hal, Hal Needham. Needham. Holy shit. Yeah, Hal, Hal Needham. Yeah, you remember that guy that was smoking the bandit deal and everything, right? For, for so, people who don't know who Hal Needham is, the uh, he is uh, a director and producer. He gave us uh, Smoking the Bandit. He gave us mm -hmm. Cannonball Run. He gave us Hooper. He gave us a shitload of movies starring Burt Reynolds and uh, and Jerry <laughs> Reed. And, uh, what a hell of a, an action director. So he and I talked for three hours flying from somewhere on the East Coast to the West Coast. And we become buds. And there is a he, him and Burt Convy owned the school bandit car. And he knew about me driving it. And it heard the story because it wasn't supposed to happen. It was supposed to be a cutaway in this thing and it made it look like I was driving it, but I wasn't driving it. But Benny and I got to be buddies. And when we got to that part of the scene, he told me to push the clutch in. He fires the thing off and says, take off. It's just a regular four speed. And I did. So, so anyway, so Hal says to me, he said, I tell you what, 
he said, if you really like this racing thing, he said, there's this race going on that they do every year in Mexico down between three cities. And he said, I'm going to have a car brought down for me. I'll have them bring two. You and I, will do, you just follow me and we'll come in one and two because nobody's going to have 200 mile an hour cars but us. <laughs> and, 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 and then if, and then if you want, oh, we'll send you to, uh, we'll, we'll send you to, uh, Buddy Baker's driving school and, you know, you can drive NASCAR because this was before, this was before they had these young new guns in NASCAR and NASCAR and wrestling were the same group of people. And exactly. all they were looking at was me was dollar signs. They said, yeah. here we got this guy who's here in the wrestling world. And by God, he wants to drive NASCAR. And that was the plan. That was that was where Dusty was about to lose his mind. Jim Crockett was about to have a coronary. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. crazy, brother. That's yeah. crazy. So that, Let me ask yeah, you a so question. The rest of the story. Let me ask you a question. You know, Jim Crockett Promotions, uh, arguably, you know, a, a tried and true, you know, at heart, southern based wrestling company. Why did you guys translate so well up in Baltimore and Philadelphia? Places because that we, because we before fought before that. Yeah, we, no, sorry, because we fought. No, it's because we fought. Philadelphia wanted to see a fight. Baltimore wanted to see a fight. They didn't want to see. They didn't want to see a bunch of you know hoopla BS crap. They if they believed that there was one match on the card. It was a shoot. It was a real by God fight. Yeah. That's what they wanted to see. And Tully and I gave them that. Rick and I gave them that. McKee and I gave them that. Oh, you yeah. Know, Dusty, Dusty was just the master, you know, rope a dope king. And, oh, yeah. and, you know, and talk and could talk all the smack and the trash that, uh, you know, everybody wanted. So, I mean, we were blood and guts and violence. And it translated yeah. well into all the major cities across the country. Incredible. Mike Messier, go ahead. Uh, Magnum, I'm going to bring up probably the most obscure question I can. Leave but, it to uh, Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Omni Thanksgiving Tag Team Tournament, November 24th, Thanksgiving night, 1983. From the, record that, I'm, from the record that I'm looking at, you tag teamed, was it with Randy Savage or Lanny Poffo and got all the no, way to the, the final? The Macho Man. No, it was Randy and I. You and, and Randy and, uh, Savage were a tag team for a one-night tournament and ended up in the finals. Yep. Just to read the results of this tournament uh, real quick, you beat the Mongolians in the first round. You took on the Bruise Brothers in the semifinals and beat them. And then you ended up against a really interesting tag team of Butch Reed and Pistol Pez Watley. And for those that don't know, before there was a Starcade. uh there was this uh, Thanksgiving night Omni tag team tournament in Atlanta, and somehow Randy Savage, uh, the Macho Man, and, and Magnum TA were a tag team. Can you tell us about that evening? It was it was really cool. So, you know, uh, Dog and and Butch and I uh, get on a private plane, and they fly us to fly us to uh, Atlanta, and uh, in you know and in. Bill just said, hey, they want you guys for this match, da 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 And at the time, I was either, I don't remember if I was a North American heavyweight champion then or in between being the champion or whatever. But it was like everybody was all wigged out about, you know, who was going to do what and and all this, this stuff. And to me, you know, it, the business is just business. I mean, I we weren't. Uh, we weren't out there. It, this wasn't WrestleMania. This was, I mean, it was a big show, but I mean, everybody was all freaked out about like, who's going to put who over. And I put, a, I think I put Pez over uh, right. in, in the match. And, right. and I, and I, and I was glad to do it. I mean, so many guys have done favors for me and I've done favors for other people. And it's just, it's the craft, it's the, it's the deal. But everybody was, I remember it so well because like everybody was like, I guess I could look kind of intimidating sometime and you know how intimate, you know, how intense Randy was. Oh, so, God, yeah. I mean, I don't even, yeah. So, so it was like, you know, like they didn't, nobody wanted to even come in the room and say what they wanted to do in the end of the match 
because they thought something horrible was going to happen. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and, and, and I, and I didn't even, I didn't even blink. They said, we need to, you know, try to get, you know, Pez is this, that, and the other. And he worked in, in Georgia championship wrestling. I said, man, I said, Pez needs to go over because I mean, he's here. This is where he makes his, makes his flipping bread and butter. I said, I'll put him over. That's no problem at all. And, and like, everybody was like dumbfounded. And we just went out and had the match, did our deal and came home and, you know, Everybody went on about their business, <laughs> and I never and, and, I, and I laughed. I laughed about it later, and I and I actually saw Randy and him, and I laughed about it one time too because you know everybody was so just weird about politics. Back, well, let's let's you know, pick up when. on that. Why? What? What is it about today's wrestling? I guess it maybe I want to say today, maybe the last 10, 15 years, where guys just don't want to do the favor. But they, I mean, everybody wants to get himself over. I, I get it. Okay. And if you're good at what you do, you'll get yourself over. But why? Well, the thing of it is that the, the one, two, three doesn't make people remember the match. It's the story you tell it's, from the exactly. time the bell rings till it's over with. I mean, exactly. I could have done a job. I could have done a job every stinking night and, 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 and done it the way you should as a baby face and, 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 and had everybody just dying for me to come back the next time and beat that son of a gun that screwed me out of whatever, you know, I mean, yeah. that, that's just part of telling the story. Uh, it's the chase for the quest that, that make that sells tickets. Once exactly. you've achieved the quest, then you've got to somehow get screwed out of it, get, get, get challenged, get, you know, something because nobody comes to a place to see their champion get beat. I mean, that isn't, you know, you can't just, you can't do that. It, it just doesn't make sense. And that's why as a world champion, you've got to be able to do so many versatile things because yeah, you're going to have the belt for a good bit and you've got to do, you know, and that's why Flair did so many uh, 60 minutes around the, the globe because he'd go to, different places and he's representing the NWA and they're telling him, you know, you either go, you're either going over or you got to do the 60 because you can't do a job. Yeah. You know? Sure. And, 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 and so, you know, uh, there, there you go. Or, or you work a program where you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to come back in a two out of three fall or a 90 minute match or, you know, just all the, 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 the different things that you do. But as soon as we gobbled up all the territories, then they started losing those opportunities uh, of doing all these creative things in different places. Yeah, Terry, Dan's got a question for you about uh, writers versus bookers. Go ahead, Dan. Um, I was going to ask, like Angela mentioned, we had talked previously about the difference between or the importance of bookers versus writers. In your experience with the, the modern product being so heavily scripted, um, what, I mean, how, how to word this properly, how would you have handled, uh, your, the talent you worked with back then have handled that attempt to basically hand you a script? This is your promo. This is your match. You're starting with this. You're starting with that. And it's, it, it wrestling evolved away from wrestling and it's a stunt show now. It's an action scripted action stunt show. How would the crew you worked with back then have handled an attempt to do that? Not too well. <laughs> Not too well, uh, you, you know. It it you, the spontaneity is like. Can you imagine? Had you know the the perfect weapon that that chair broke into to paint that death defying picture that people see of me standing over Tully when I let him live and when they thought I was going to gouge that that spike through his head. You couldn't script that. You know, exactly. you, you know, we didn't even know what we were going to use for a gimmick. And the, that, that wasn't any more. She, we were looking, she was just looking for something. We knew we were going to have a foreign object. That's all we knew. We had no idea that yeah. we were end up, you know, with this historic event, you know, when all that took place. And if you take away the spontaneity, then you take away the creativity. You take away your ability to adapt to the crowd being different in one place than it is or another, you, you kill the craft of the storytelling. 
and there's people there that can still do it. Uh, I mean, there are there. I mean, for instance, I mean, Ricochet, Ricochet, you'd say, oh, my gosh, he's a he's just a high flyer spot guy. I've watched him work a match where he didn't do one high flying thing the entire match. Exactly. And, 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 and can work a hold and tell a story and do spots that make sense and sell things like they make sense and, and do it all. So there's people that can do it. It's just that the television commodity that they produce dictates that if they don't know every camera angle they need to catch and to catch it live, they can't produce the product they're accustomed to producing. That's the yeah. that's the different that that's the difference because I've sat and watched a a live recording of WWE programming and mm-hmm. and 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 saw something that seemed so flat and so lackluster and just like what I would call in the building a C match. Gone back and watched it recorded with all the all the zoom ins and the high, and the camera angles and everything that they did when they yeah. when they shot it. And it was like the difference in the sitting on a movie set and only seeing things from one perspective and then sitting in the movie theater and seeing yeah. the final product. So I, that's how much it's evolved and changed. Interesting go. segue. Um, Terry, we have a guy. Uh, actually, we have two guys on the show tonight that uh, that are associated with one particular gentleman. I wanna, I'm going to segue into this. Mike Messier is a very dear friend and uh, uh, a frequent guest uh, f- of Vince Russo's The Brand. He's uh, good friends with Vince. He knows Vince Russo very well. Um, our friend Tombstone Jesus has been the recipient of Vince Russo's writing. Now, I have said on the show before, I've been on Vince Russo's network, uh, but I have never met Vince Russo. I've never had a conversation with him. I've been on other programs on his network. What do you think of Vince Russo, Terry, as a wrestling personality? <laughs> and be I honest, know him. You, I, I, I would. I would. I, this, this is how di- much a dinosaur I am. I know the name. I wouldn't know him if I ran into him. I don't know what he's produced. I don't know. I don't know anything. About him, other than the fact that I know he had something to do with the WWE when he gave, you know, they were. He when, gave us the Attitude were, Era. Okay. Well, then, yeah. if he gave us the Attitude Era, he's got some talent because that was the best thing that that I've ever seen them produce. So he must be a he must be a smart man. Well, uh, interestingly enough, and I know Mike Messier is going to chime in. On this one, there was a book written called The Death of WCW, which okay. featured Vince Russo's photo on the cover prominently. Mikey, take it from there. Well, um, I mean, I think that was Brian Alvarez's book, if I'm not mistaken. It was. And, and Brian really contended that when Vince Russo, who was kind of a high profile writer for the WWF during the Attitude Era of Magnum, he came over to WCW, I think, in late 1999. Kind of made himself a, an on-screen character as well. Uh, did a lot of stuff that was breaking the fourth wall. Uh, probably, surprisingly, Angelo, even more so than for my personal tastes. But uh, Vince Russo actually wrote himself to win the WCW World Championship at a time when the title was really. It, I mean, they had David Arquette, the actor, win it. They had they had the title kind of get vacated through a Jeff Jarrett yeah. Hulk Hogan. Uh, work shoot thing on awry. I guess what 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 there was would lead me, Magnum, is more to the fact that after um, you know the tragic car accident that we all know about in uh, I believe the actual date was October thirteenth, nineteen eighty six. If I have that off the top of my head, but you Fourth ended up, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You ended up behind the scenes a bit with Dusty, and I remember mm-hmm. that you did some commentary work. Uh, I mean, I remember being at the. Uh, Starkey 1991 in the Norfolk Scope, and I believe you were there in a tuxedo with Eric Bischoff mm-hmm. and Izzy Hyatt. And one of the yep. things about your career and wrestling journey that people don't talk about that maybe we can bring up here 
is that you had several years where you were behind the scenes, WCW, kind of in that transitional time from the Crockett's to the Turner uh, people. Yeah. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about us? Just kind of an open-ended question, but your time behind the scenes working with uh, the Bischoffs, the Dusties, the, the Missy Hyatt's, all those interesting characters that you worked with. It, it was, it was, a it, it was a great education uh, to corporate America, to, to big business side. Of, and it was TBS and Crockett's were gone. They'd sold it to Turner at that point in time. And so I had the, you know, I, I had a, a, a short run during the, the Jim Hurd days and then uh, uh, and had his secretary call me and say they no longer required my services, only to have to call me back about a year later and rehire me because Dusty got the, they called Dusty to be the booker. And, and Dusty said, uh, if, yeah, I'll be the booker, but Magnum's going to be my right hand. And so then then there had to be some crow eating and readjusting of things and and uh, they had to bring me back and uh, then i saw then i saw her shown the door <laughs> uh, shortly thereafter and uh, went through the kip fry era and then the bill watts era uh, of that that deal and to be honest it was it was painful time for me because i was doing only thing i knew how to do trying to adapt in a world that I had, you know, invested my every ounce of energy in yeah. and then trying to find my way back in to something that I could get some satisfaction from. And so now I'm only 28, 29 years old mm -hmm. and, you know, should have been, you know, in my prime doing my thing and I'm, and I'm having to sit on the sidelines and talk about it. And also work with the talent and negotiate contracts and and take care of disciplinary actions with people uh, when they're you know getting out of out of line uh, with their corporate responsibilities and their contractual responsibilities and it, it was not uh, not a time that I I have fond memories of because it was painful yeah a reminder of what I, I what I couldn't do. Uh, yeah. Even though I had defied the odds and a million to one odds, I was told that I would ever walk again, which was a miracle and, and a huge thing. I couldn't find my way in that world uh, to to make it all make sense in my head. When yeah. I was had people around me that had changed their whole way of thinking. I came from a, a era of you produced, you drew a house. You exactly. were the main event, and you got a percentage of that gate by what you had drawn. And I yep. was now in a world of a payroll of $9 million for wrestling talent that was guaranteed mailbox money they got every two weeks, whether they flip, flop, flew, drew a dime, did anything spectacular yeah. or not. And you couldn't have the same conversations with athletes in that mindset that you could yeah. A couple of years per prior to when when I was, you know, in my in my heyday of what I was doing, and that yeah. evolution is part of what undid the 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 true inspiration of what drove guys to giving world class performances. And to the matter of the belt, let me just say this about that real quick: the minute mm -hmm. the ten pounds of gold got retired and the big belt was made, the world championship, as it was known, all the way back to Ed Strangler Lewis and all the days, yep. ceased to exist. It Go quit on. that day because then it became a corporate-owned belt and yep. something that didn't have to pay homage to the NWA, the oldest governing body in professional wrestling, or the, exactly. or the heritage that was laid out by all the men the Harley races, the Dory and Terry Funks, sure. you know, the, the, that list of people. There was a handful of people over 20 years that wore that belt. They were all, they yeah. were all voted on. They were all had the support of all the, the members of the NWA prior to receiving that belt and that opportunity to represent everybody in the NWA. 
And when that all changed, that that day it it went from being what it was to what it evolved to. Yeah. We're going to do our last round of questions. I'll start off. Um, and where you left off was a great segue for this question. What do you think of the uh, new resurgence of the NWA? With, um, Mr. I think, Billy Corrigan? I believe that's you know, his name. It's, it's, um, it's, I, I, I love Billy. I, I did a couple things with them uh, when they did the, the, uh, the Crockett tournament thing they did a couple of years ago here in the Carolinas. Uh, the Kitty and I did a, uh, did a thing for them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad that, that some, there's someone there keeping the name uh, of it alive because it deserves to be alive. But I, I can't, there's always been things that have been, you know, a little off color in, you know, wrestling things that, we we had along with the the hardcore things that we did. We had right. the energy. I mean, I mean, Jimmy Boogie Woogie Man Valiant, who I love to death. Oh, we love not, Jimmy. He, Good he, friend you know, of the show. Jimmy, yeah, you know, and Jimmy and superstar Billy Graham could go out there on a card where Tully and I were all but you know just literally killing each other because we had an eight month program up to that I quit match. There, there were hundreds of matches equally as violent or more violent than what everybody remembers in the I Quit match. Yeah. So on that same card could be Jimmy Valiant and Superstar Billy Graham, and they could you know do some funny stuff and do different things, and it didn't take away from the intensity of what we did, right? So they sure. they they could exist in the same world, but. The world of what the NWA has tried to do with people trying to be, you know, stand up comics in the middle of of something that you're, you know, yeah. you're trying to to tell a story with things that just I can't wrap my head around. Yeah, uh, I'm yeah. with you, brother. The, I, I am. The, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I, I want to see it, it, it work. And, and, and of course, it could never. You can't turn the clock back, and it can't be, you know, what this thing once was. But there's still got to be a mainstream, set, you know, steady storyline thing there in the middle of all of it that that makes sense. And I told somebody, sure. so if I would have been Billy Corgan and had his influence, I would have been trying to do something to have my NWA World Champion working in accordance with all the organizations around. The country, even the WWE, all of them, to have my champion yeah. going around working in all these other venues to make it really like mean something. If you're the champion sure. of a group of fifteen people, what exactly are you the champion of? Exactly. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's got to exactly. appear that, you, that you're the champion of five hundred plus people that are all aspiring to want what you have. And exactly. they can't they they can't any more paint that picture than any of these other you know people that are trying really hard to to have you know wrestling programs and yeah. and it and it looks you know it looks just amateurish yeah uh, it sure does through, and, and and it's you know and and I hate it I hate it for them because it, it, to me walking out in front of a a crowd of eight to ten thousand people that are like on fire and electric is yeah. like the biggest rush in the world. Doesn't have to oh, be gosh. seventy thousand. Doesn't have to be that. But I mean, eight to ten thousand people that really want to see what you're doing and hanging on every move and every word yeah. uh, is is like as good as it gets. And and these Absolutely. guys just don't 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 get that opportunity. And I'm sorry, because yeah. I'd love to see. The NWA, you know, have that kind of opportunity. Well, speaking of opportunities, let's talk about uh, a young lady you must be very proud of, uh, Tessa. Oh, talk about opportunity, kind of, taking the opportunity yeah. and running with it. Yeah, and and you know, she she's and she's got all the right stuff. She's got the uh, she's got that intangible thing. That you can't buy, uh, you can't that. even earn. You've got to have it. 
You've yeah. got to have the it factor. And then you can sprinkle in the the look and, and the physique and the ring skills and the mic skills. But if you don't have the it thing, you're not going to go but so far. And she had it from sure. the very beginning, and she's worked her rear end off. And I'm just – I'm one of her biggest fans, and I just want to. I'm waiting for the day that she has the opportunity to get on a stage, befitting the 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 true talent that she has the potential to be, so she can take herself to the next level, and, well, and get in if, that fishbowl, you know, with with all the the big players. If my opinion matters for anything, um, and and I hope it does, because I'm your friend and your buddy. Um, if my opinion matters, uh, in my opinion, keep her the hell away from WWE at all costs. Well, that's not, uh, they will, that, they that, will yeah, that, kill yeah, her not, career. Yeah. That poor girl yeah, that, won't have a career. Yeah. That, that would be a side note. Yeah. That, that would, 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 and I'm not going to say never happen because her and Ashley would, would, her and Ashley could make more money in the right setting with each other, against each other, whatever, than any two women have ever ever made in the sport, in the business. Yeah. They, and because that's why it'll of the never heritage, happen. Because, because, well, don't never say never. You well, never here's never my – because you know what? And, and you're right. They, they say in wrestling, never say never. But here's my problem. When it makes sense, count on that company not to do it. Right. Because I'm, they're not. I'm, I'm, I was a, yeah. I wouldn't count on that company to do it. You have to think outside the box. Well, brother, I'm going to tell you. I, 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 yeah, I never said it was going to be under the banner of of, WWE. of that control. Yeah, yeah. I never said that. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you what. Uh, for both of their sakes, and I hope if uh, – if Ashley Fleer uh, has an opportunity to get the hell out, I, I hope to God she takes it. Um, just as soon as her contract is up, I hope she runs and doesn't look back. We're going to go around the horn with one final question for Magnum TA. Mikey Messier, we'll start with you. Keep it short. Magnum, do you remember, I believe it was Crockett Cup 86, you and Ronnie Garvin teamed up. And I think, if I'm not mistaken... The quarterfinal round, you guys beat uh, Giant Baba and Tiger Mask, if I have that right. And I just <laughs> thought I thought it was – I'm going by memory here. There's no Wi-Fi or anything. But, Magnum, do you have any memories of, of wrestling two guys? I'm not sure if that was Tiger Mask one or two and Baba, who was a legit seven feet tall. Just kind yeah. of – just the mechanics of working with guys who didn't speak English as a first language. Well, how about this? We – you know – we didn't. We didn't. Um, we didn't see each other. There was no back room to, you know, go over and say hi. You know, I've never met either one of them in my life. You know, Ronnie and I. It was supposed to be Dusty and I. We switched it all up at the last minute. Made it Ronnie and I in the tournament. And and uh, Dusty says, "I got this great idea." And I said, "What's that?" He said. He said, you know that Tiger Mask guy, he likes to fly off the top rope. He said, let him fly off the top rope, catch him, and belly to belly him. <laughs> I said, okay, sure, sounds great. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't know whether he weighs, you know, a buck 75 or 250, but I'm. But Dusty said, go do it. I'm going to catch him when he comes off the top rope and belly to belly him. <laughs> yeah, and I did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the way we rolled back then. <laughs> that's the way it it made, it made a great photograph. I remember that photograph of yeah. that exact moment. But I, I just, it just fascinated me, that match in particular. Then, of course, you guys went on to face the Road Warriors. And uh, it, it seemed to be like a great time. You know, the Crockett Cup in New Orleans, the first one. Oh, it was, it was more, it was, a, it was absolutely nuts. And it was. It was kind of funny because it was like I'd wrestled in that building for Bill Watts, I don't know how many times when I was in Mid South because I was there for a year and a half and and we were on fire, and when I left Bill, the territory was on fire. They, yeah. They, you know, 
they they were smoking. I was in the program with uh, with Ernie for the you know he, I dropped the North American title to him, and when I gave my notice here I'm this top baby face. I gave him a notice that I'm going to go to work for the Crockett's, who at the time were on their rear ends. The boys were making uh, a, a fifth of what I was making uh, working for him. Yeah. I worked a six week notice for Bill, and I and we, and I had to hear about it during our team meeting before TV for six weeks. Oh and my it God. was brutal. Yeah. And and I mean and, and it was in some in just but you know, Bill's a type A personality kind of guy. And and oh, so yeah. to come back so to come back as a bigger star than I'd ever been for Bill, you know, in into the Superdome yeah. was it was kind of a it was kind of a you know, I wasn't quite so crazy, was I, Bill? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, moment. You know, you and, know, Terry. Uh, it, but it was special. In answering Mike's question, you you prompted me to 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 remember something I watched today. I spent the afternoon watching a, a lot of matches. I I watched, of course, Tombstone Jesus for quite a while. Our friend here. And I watched a lot of Magnum TA, and I noticed something that I never noticed before, and I want to I want to ask you about it. When you did your belly to belly suplex, it always came from the left. What's the deal with that? So when you that was a shoot move, okay? So it wasn't a work. So okay. I figured I figured out. I think I figured out early on by happenstance that I could do that move to anybody, whether they were 250, 300, 350, it didn't matter. I could do it to anybody. And, and I remembered it. I said, whenever I, if I ever get a break and I ever get to be a star somewhere, I'm going to use that move because you don't want somebody to be able to screw your finish up. Sure. And and so yeah, I always took them to the left because that's where I mean it was it you know they could go with it, not go with it, you know, jump, not jump, it didn't matter. They were going to go, and yeah. and that's the way. Well, I was going to uh, going to ask you if you ever had like anybody try to resist going to the left and try to swerve you to the right. One time, and and it's on a video, and it wasn't a swerve. It was a, it was it was an accident. But oh. uh, uh, Barry Darso went oh, sure. to go to the right, and yeah. I had caught him, and he was about <laughs> two two ninety, and he oh, jumped and he went right, and I turned his momentum in the air and turned him back and went to the left, and he went on a whirlwind of a ride, <laughs> and oh, and, it, and it's on that it, and it's on a video that uh, that oh, I gotta check together. out now. And and uh, it's that one where uh, they did a video. Uh, I think it was to my way or something. Frank Sinatra song, and <laughs> and, it, 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 and it's in that video. And you watch and you'll see him. He jumps to the right, and he is in full swing. And I catch him and I spin him and I turn him back to the left because I couldn't do it any other way. I got to check that one out. Dan the man. Yeah. One final question from Magnum TA. Well, I was going to ask you about the. Belly to belly, but Angelo beat me to it. So that's of course I'm old and I'm smart. <laughs> I have to know uh, my previous question. You mentioned the 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 natural flow of things, and you talked about the the famous incident with the chair. How just organic that felt. I have to mm -hmm. know wrestling fans being simultaneously the best and worst people in the world. Uh, how how often <laughs> when you get questions do you still get people who think that chair was gimmicked? Good question, Dan. Not, you know what? I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. That's a really good question. I, I don't think I've ever had anybody ask me that, ever. We have the smartest panelists in all of wrestling podcasts, by the way. Without a doubt. Thank you. <laughs> That's a really great question, Dan. You know, I, would, I never thought to ask that. But ha has anybody ever broached that subject with you? Never. No. You know, I mean, uh, it... Uh, I mean, Kelly and I have been, done many panels talking about it. And, and uh, you know, we just talked about how it was, you know, just crazy that this thing yeah. appeared out of this chair 
when it was thrown down uh, in funny. And, and uh but yeah you couldn't have come up you couldn't have made that on a hollywood set any I'm better than serious. what that came out with. yeah tombstone jesus mike schroeder you got the final you had the opening question and you got the final question thank you brother magnum no one's brought it up i gotta ask you uh you know what was it like being the heartthrob you know and i i say that word i mean we go. had we had you know midnight express the teeny boppers were going crazy and i mean i'm a 15 14 year old kid just watching this go down and uh you know rick flair he had the ladies it seemed like he might have paid a few of them but he had them you know but <laughs> magnum ta you literally seen women going out of their mind in the audience everywhere man and uh i mean i think you're on a level of, of elvis presley at, at the time it was it was, it, it, what was, it, that it was like? uh, i mean it, the, it, it was it was surreal elvis of wrestling you, yeah, you, you it, it it defied logic, uh, and that, that that TV that TV was so powerful that it 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 reached so many people, and they yeah. you know they did they cast me they cast me in that role, and uh, you know and it, you're right I mean the 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 teeny boppers the eight to thirteen year olds were you know losing their mind over the Rock and Roll Express and and you know Rick was just Rick. Uh, you know, Mr. Space Mountain, but I mean, I, I was the, I was the, I had the 18 to the 30 group locked down pretty, pretty solid. Dude, I think, you, had the, you had the 12 to 82 year old group locked down. <laughs> <laughs> any, anything that was female was pretty much, uh, I had never seen anything like it since, to be honest with you, man. So, uh, uh that no. been amazing. Did you have a girlfriend at the time? Oh, uh, one or two, the, the, but nobody ever survived very long because it was, uh, you know, I mean, I was in a different port seven days a week and, uh, it, it was, it, it was just, it was impossible. It was an impossible, uh, ride to be on with anybody but yourself. Uh, wow. cause it was just, it was just too, too absolutely insane. I, I don't, I can't really imagine, uh, other than being, you know, like, like you said, uh, a rock star or something like that. Uh, I mean, you you couldn't you couldn't go anywhere, do anything anything yeah. thing that you weren't rec yeah, recognized. And, um, and and then when people did see you, uh, then you know <laughs> that that's that's a whole nother chapter. And now that I'm a yeah. dad of uh, of twins, I can't I can't really relay that chapter too well. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll uh, we'll we'll have to. Uh include a part two in this and maybe between now and then you can figure out between you and mikey messier because he's a hell of a writer how to edit that for broadcast <laughs> there you go well jerry well, well, i want to <laughs> extend a, a, a huge huge thank you for being with us and being so generous with your time and uh and i know you've got some stuff going on at home and we uh, wish you the best and god bless um, I will call you in a couple of days to check in on you, make sure you're all right. And um, sounds good, man. Just, uh, just know that you've got, uh, you know, four guys here who love you, yeah. and uh, will always remember that legacy. And uh, and your legacy's not over, brother. You know, your legacy lives uh, through uh, your matches, through video, through our memories, and through Tessa. Very and uh, we are honored to have had you as a guest, and I hope you will uh, will join us again. Sounds good, guys. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Magnum. you so much. Take care. Magnum Take TA, care, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, Magnum. Dream come amazing, true right amazing here. Interviewer. Mike Messier, your just thoughts. Re- what do you think about Magnum TA? Well, you know, just real quick, um, when I was a kid in the backseat of a car, there was a wrestler magazine. I don't need to hear that story, Mikey. <laughs> well, this is this is this is a PG one, but I remember picking up the copy of the wrestler, and they had an introducing. They would have an introducing article of the young wrestlers coming up on the scene, and Terry Allen was in uh, Florida wrestling, and he was the first wrestler I can remember 
being from Virginia, Chesapeake Bay, Virginia. Yeah. And I think they gave him at the time the weight of 243 or 245. Yeah. And um, years later, I didn't get to tell Magnum on the show, but I was at the Crockett Cup as a young kid when he came out in 87 in Baltimore. So I'm surprised you didn't, because you and I talked about that. I'm surprised you didn't bring that up. Well, there was just so many things to talk about, but it was it was at a Magnum and I actually talked before the show when we were getting our our, our lines together. But being okay. in the arena, uh, you know, thirteen thousand fans in Baltimore, inner city right. wrestling, and to see Magnum TA because, like he said, they thought he may never walk again. Yeah, coming. It's a long walk from the dressing room to the ring. And oh yeah, a guy you know who, what? It's uh, you know, I actually watched that today, Mike. Yeah, and, and the guy. Uh, I'll tell you what you could see in the first, uh, I guess the first three to five rows, uh, just everyone, male, female, young, old, they were just all, just full of tears and tears and smiles at the same time. We were glad and, he was uh, alive, and it even looked like Dusty got a little choked up there. Well, the thing when is, Dusty Angelo brought him out. The thing is, if people saw the photograph of his Porsche that was wrapped around that damn telephone. Oh, yeah, I've seen it. And this was 1986, guys. This was This was not 2020 where you have the jaws of life in every police station. Sure. But people were concerned that this guy was not going to live through the night. Oh, I know. And and it's. I was going to say, if I remember the story, he they he was in the car for several hours before anybody even called law enforcement. Yeah. Right. Well, the and problem, the problem, Dan, was that at the time he was pushing two seventy or better, and jacked to the gills, uh, and the car was. I mean, if you saw it, you wonder, you know, not only how did he get in it, but how did he get out of it. You know, and he was there for quite a bit of time. Um, he worked himself out to a point uh, just about the time that, you know, uh, help arrived. But he, he was a big guy. I mean, he's still a big guy. But you're talking about a guy that's, you know, 265, 275 and just, you know, jacked. You know? Well, uh, when, pe- when people question pro wrestling and, you know, look. Whatever you, whatever term you want to use, but when you talk about a guy fighting for his life, yeah, and and coming out the other side and having family, having successful businesses, yeah, still yeah. being a part of the pro wrestling, and here we are, thirty years later, we're still talking about still this guy's about exactly. career, like he said, only lasted six years. That's a champion, right there. So, but I'm going to tell you what, brother, that was a, that was a full six years, and that was an action packed six years. Yeah, Tombstone man. Jesus, let's talk about it. you and I spoke privately. You said, uh, you know, you jumped at it when I said, you know, come on the show with us. And oh hell yeah, you know, oh uh, hell yeah, no, I want to thank you again. You know, and, and oh uh, brother, look, I, I like brought you on here for a come reason. True to me, I, I wrestle all over, and everybody, anybody who knows anything, you know, I'll, I'll hear Shawn Michaels. Sometimes I get told I'm a male version of Shawn Michaels. But anybody who's been around, they say, they say Magnum TA. And when they do, brother, let me tell you, I get the biggest smile on my face. And it couldn't be a bigger compliment. You know, and I don't think oh, anyone ever in the business had a rocket strapped to their ass yeah. like that. That, that deserved it, could handle it. You know, I mean, just listening to him, you know, everybody who laid eyes yeah. on him said, this guy's gold. And he's yeah. a badass for real. You know, sure. I mean, look at him. I mean, he said his heroes was like John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. And that's what came across on the screen. Only he made those oh, guys look like pussies. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know, and it's funny that you, that, and I'm glad you brought it up, Mike. Because earlier in the conversation, you pointed out that, you know, he was a manly man. You know, he had a lot of the guys we see have, you know, the shaved chest. Yeah. Magnum had hair on his chest. Yep. You know, I saw a match today with you, as a matter of fact, where a guy grabbed a handful of your hair on your chest. 
Yeah, and Velcro is my biggest nightmare at this point. <laughs> but, uh, no, hey, when I was a kid, like I say, I was adopted. I didn't know what I'd look like, you know, but I right. grew up in the 70s. Burt Reynolds, Tom Selleck, and, uh, you know, I, I just prayed to God I'd have hair on my chest. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and again, Magnum, Magnum, he was, he was a man's man, you know. It was yeah. like oh, watching an old Western badass. Yeah. And, yeah. and on top of that, yeah, I mean, he, he was just it for me. Yeah, he and really I, was. you know, it's funny because I watched you wrestle. And I don't know whether, and I honestly don't, and I'm, I'm pretty good at, you know, telegraphing stuff. But I honestly don't know whether this was your natural wrestling style or whether you, you know, subconsciously wrestle like him because, you know, you looked up to him so much. But you wrestle a lot like he did. And and it's because I looked up to him so much, you guys. I mean, literally, when I was a kid, I was like, that's what I want to look like. That's what I want to be like. Yeah. You know, and you mentioned you had, there was a lot of big guys with shaved chests and, and Hulk Hogan hair and, and the tan. You know, you had the peroxide. Yeah. I mean, Buddy Rogers did it best, or Flair probably did it best. Buddy, too, yeah. you know. And, yeah. And I, I love that. I, I love that. But when Magnum come along, you know, and I, and I mentioned um, Billy Jack, too. There was another guy. Oh, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Big yeah. manly dude, you know. Who could We've actually done. tried to get him on the show, um, but his phone number is disconnected right now. Oh man, so I can't reach him. I'm just trying to get Billy Jack to do the show, but you know, like I said, his numbers. Well, there's an interesting man right there. Oh, I mean, brother, let me tell you, you got, something. I, yeah. I got a friend of mine who who interviewed Billy twice, and he's. He's always an interesting interview because wow. you never know who's going to show up. <laughs> that guy, man, I'll tell you, what a life, huh? Oh, brother. Dan, you had the opportunity tonight. What do you think, kid? Uh, interviews like this, the reason I agreed to come on the show. I mean, when you, when, you, when you first called me and offered me the spot at co-host and you listed some of the names that were coming up, Magnum TA was one of the names that really jumped out at me. Yeah, it's well it's moments like this. That speaking of names, we're going to go over some names that are coming on the show. But okay. before I do, I've got to ask Tombstone about some items behind him. And there's a, a big old gold shiny belt there. What is that, brother? That's the core championship belt. Bro. Oh, That's here you me. go. I am your DCW core champion. So I got uh, AK-47 blood type, you guys. I don't age in regular years. I age in <laughs> badass years. That's great. In mortal years, I'm going to be 50. And in badass years, I'm about 23, right in the peak of my uh, my Love physicality. It. But uh, <laughs> now, that's it. Devotion Championship Core Champion right here, brother. Thanks let's, for bringing Let's it talk up. about that for a couple of minutes because I'm actually going to do a show with you. Um, and I should tell everybody, Tombstone Jesus is coming back for his own show, his own segment. And uh, we're going to uh, explore Devotion Championship Wrestling and Vince Russo's tie to that company. But I had mentioned to you when we first got together that uh, the, um, the understanding I was given, and, and again, I don't know who it came from, but the understanding I was given that this was some sort of a, a faith-based organization. Yeah. But it, so, so, straighten me, smarten me up. Yeah. What What is you, devotion? You couldn't be wrong. You couldn't be further. Um, but I could see where that would kind of come around. The name Devotion Championship Wrestling it's it's people have said devotional championship wrestling before. I've actually heard and that. You yeah. got me, Tombstone Jesus. Okay, well, I got in the business through my musical career. I'm I'm a musician, guys. Get on YouTube, sub my channel, check out some of my music as well. Yeah, that's kind of what got me in the business. But uh, I'm a wrestling fan who looked like Jesus, and and people used to call me Jesus all the time. 
one day I was threatened to threatening to tombstone somebody in a bar and somebody yelled out tombstone Jesus. And I says, that's it. That's, that's the name it. of my band. I'm going to be, that's my wrestling name. And the rest yeah. is history on that. So I'll tell you what, and it makes we're it out of it. Utah. And Utah is just, this place is just crawling with Mormons. Okay. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, you you guys record your show right in the heart of Salt Lake City. You don't right. get more Mormon than that. <laughs> right, right. But I'll tell you what, yeah. Tombstone Jesus makes a hell of a t-shirt. It's a oh, great well, looking shirt. I got to send you one, brother. I got to <laughs> send you one. Well, I got, some, I got something for you. That's oh, what okay. I'm talking about. And can you see that? Hold on. I lost it in the green screen, Just, but put it to your chest, Angelo. Put it to your there chest. We, there it is. Yeah, That's yeah. My microphone. Here you go. Hell yeah. There you go. So, so back to the religious thing. So, so yeah. I think being from Utah, right? And then there's one other gimmick I got to tell you guys about. Our yeah. tag team champions are the Brothers Smith, and they. Yeah come to the ring they look like full-blown missionaries mormon missionaries yeah or maybe uh, jehovah witnesses right right and uh it's kind of been a long story i actually put the guys underneath my wing and i've been training them and they've been clanging and banging in the gym and yeah it took a while but they're the champions and so so, uh, you know, that might be another reason why people think it's kind of a religious show, but uh, yeah. we're not pushing it. But it's kind not. Of well, I'll anybody. tell you what the giveaway was for me, as I watched quite a bit of your programs today. The yeah. giveaway for me was the male versus female match. Um, I don't know who the tattooed girl is, but she's got. Tat What's her name? Her name's Rekka Tahaka. Okay. Yeah. And she's got a feud going with this uh, scrawny, pencil neck geek kind of looking guy. And what is his name? Porter Blake. That's it, yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought to myself, boy, they're pushing the envelope in Salt Lake City. Because uh, <laughs> I thought this, this can't be a, a religious organization. I don't think so. No. No, yeah. we're just wrestling. Well, yeah, but I want to tell you something. It, it, and consider this a compliment. That's a good product, and I like what I saw. I watch NXT, and I'm not crazy about what I'm watching. So I'm yeah. putting that over NXT. Hey, I, you know, you, got, I a, you got a good that. product. You got that a real good means a lot to us out here. It really does, brother. And how'd you get hooked you up with TV Vince Russo? Deal. I'll tell you, Vince Russo, let me tell you, guys, I, uh, for me, you know, what Magnum said kind of said it all, but for me, guys, the Attitude Era was everything, and I was a fan my whole life, but for me, it peaked with, with Stone Cold and The Rock. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd have Nitro parties, guys, or, I mean, raw parties, not nitro parties. Yeah. And there'd be a pile of beer cans piled up in the corner of the <laughs> garage. We'd have a TV out in the garage, and I'd have a couple fuckers knocked out in them. You know, because <laughs> because that's how much I got into wrestling and loved oh, yeah. the Attitude Era. And I mean, sure. it's, you know, that was, I mean, to go from cartoon characters to the Godfather and, yeah. you know, pimping and all that, yeah. it was, and you it know was wow. And, and you know what, Mike? I think that's what what Magnum was getting at. You know that you know when I asked him about you know how they this Southern organization played in Baltimore and Philadelphia, and he answered it perfectly because it was it was a fight. People oh, wanted yeah. to see a fight. Oh, yeah. Not, they didn't want to see you know over the top you know cartoony kind of characters. Um, and that Mike was Messier. hard hitting. Yes. You, you're friends with Vince Russo. What do you know about uh, his association with um, with devotion? You know, I'll be honest. I don't know too much about it, but I want to hear more about it. I've heard Vince mention it. I know that one thing that Vince Russo does sometimes is he's, he kind of categorizes things. Like when he does his brand podcast, right. mm -hmm. that's one aspect of his life. Right. The different shows are kind of subcategories. And yeah. the devotion championship wrestling is... 
he doesn't try to force the brand members you have to go watch devotion championship wrestling to be part of the brand and yeah and i'm guessing you know uh tombstone jesus could probably reiterate i would guess that vince russo doesn't say to the wrestlers in devotion wrestling hey guys you have to go pay 395 a month for the brand it, it's just a thing that vince russo in my mind compartmentalizes things in yeah. a way that that just that's the way that's the way he does things in my opinion yeah, uh, mike how did you guys even get russo to come to, to to utah of all places well manny manny lemons uh owns the company devotion championship wrestling okay he wrestles all over and uh he got a chance to meet vince in denver uh when vince was working with another promotion there Right. And uh, Manny just stayed on him and stayed on him and stayed on him and finally got Vince to come out. Vince come out and watch the show and said, you know what? You got believable characters here. You guys got some passion here. And yeah. uh, he's willing to be a part of it. And so for me, you know, I mean, I'm I'm thinking, wow, here comes Vince Russo, you know, like, uh, I guess I'll wait yeah. around and see when he wants to talk to me. Or The guy couldn't yeah. be more approachable. And, yeah. uh, you know, as far as just for me, the guy's a genius. Okay. And yeah, I don't want to get too far into to just what was going on, but he injected yeah. something into a, a match, uh, that was genius. Yeah. And it went over like you wouldn't believe. And, uh, yeah. for me, it was just like off the top of his head, something we hadn't even thought about. And that sure. was really before he was writing the show for us and stuff. Yeah. And you know, it's so, funny because um, Dan and I, in fact, Dan, and I and, and and Mike the other night when we did our special roundtable, we were talking about characters uh, or, or more so the lack of characters. Right. And I know that Vince is, is very big into the character development. And uh, and Dan and I, you know, we're kind of like I'm not a, a huge I'm not a Russo Mark. You know, I listen to the guy's show. Uh, sometimes he comes up with a gem that I like. Yeah, but I listen to everybody, you know? Sure, sure. Um, but Dan and I were talking about characters and, and the or the lack thereof hmm. and, uh, and how they play out now and whether characters can even get over anymore. Dan, you got questions for Tombstone? Well, um... I'll admit, and and we've talked about this before, I'm not the biggest Vince Russo fan uh, for right. some of his work. However, I will give him credit. One thing we do agree on, what Angelo had mentioned, was characters. And one thing Vince Russo was always good at, even in some of the moments that I may not have agreed with, was motivation. You know, that's oh, yeah. When you talk about characters, it doesn't have to be... Uh, you know Kamala the the giant or you know uh, uh, Ultimate Warrior. It doesn't have to be a character, but it has to be somebody besides John Smith, Dave, whoever. You yeah, know, people with names that, that are wrestling just because. There's no yeah. There's no motivation, and and be it the Attitude Era, be it you know some of his things in WCW that worked. Yeah, and some of the obviously some of the products he's done since then that have been good quality <laughs> is. Whether you're a character or you're wrestling under a, a, a I don't want to say a real name, but you know, a, a, just a, a well, first last name kind of I'm person. Glad you, you I'm glad a, you a said drive, that. If you have a drive, you have a reason. I understand why, like Magna mentioned, you know, I understand why you're a heel, why you're a face, why you yeah. two hate each other. Right. It, it doesn't have to be, you know, I, I'm I'm the best. I want to be the best wrestler. I want to be the best. Let me tell you well, who the best can guys. I'm sorry, you've got 10 guys on your roster with, with the same motivation and the same look and the same nonchalant. Yeah. Then if every if nobody's a character or or if everybody's the same character, then nobody's a character. Right. Well, let me let me chime in here. I think you'll all agree. And you better agree because I'll beat you all up. Um, I think you'll all agree <laughs> that the yeah, I know, right? Go pumping the guns, right? I think you'll all agree. That the best characters, and correct me if I'm wrong. If you, if you think I'm wrong, tell me. The best characters in wrestling are real guys turned up a notch. Oh, yes. Yep. I agree with that. Oh, and that was Magnum. 
right? And I don't even know if he was that turned up. That guy was just that awesome. Right, but exactly. You, when you've seen him come to the ring, you're like, that's a real guy. Exactly. He's a badass. You yeah, he just tweaks where... it up a little bit. And I think that's what Russo does so well. Because re remember something, we talked, we all talked about this on the show before. Vince Russo doesn't come from the wrestling world. He comes from the writing world. He's a writer. His job is to take a person, a person, and create a character for that person. That comes from the imagination. But if you got a guy like Steve Austin, who is who he is, mm -hmm. he's got no gimmick, black trunks, black boots. He doesn't come out with long, wavy hair. You know, a guy with a shaved head. Right? Right. He's just himself cranked up. Yeah. You know? Go ahead, Mikey. To your point, Angelo, I'm watching... Um, Spring, spent, spring Stampede 2000. This is right. when they stripped all the champions in WCW of the belts, and they had like a one-night, three-tournament night. Ric Flair and Lex Luger are teaming up against Shane Douglas and Marcus Bagwell, and they're playing up the whole ECW, Shane Douglas, yeah. and Mike Awesome, Scott Steiner, Sting, Vampiro. My point is that show is 20 years old, and I'm watching right. that now, and it's more cutting edge, and it's more present. Yeah. And this, the, the, the storyline may not even be to my liking, right. which is, you know, the writers are getting sick of these old millionaires clubs, and they're pushing the new blood. But there is a storyline yeah. that goes from the first match to the last match. Sure. And it's it, it may not be the best storyline, but you can it's follow something, it. You can it's follow something the that's missing. That here, here is the. Remember this, and Mikey, you know this because you're a writer. Yes. In writing, especially writing for television, there's something that's called a continuity director. Right. Okay. Yep. The continuity director keeps the flow of the story. Going throughout the story. Correct. In wrestling, that's what Vince did in the Attitude Era to make it so successful. When they got rid of that caliber of writer and hired young kids on internship programs, they yeah. lost their continuity. Now, you can have the beginning of the show with one match ending the end of the show with another match and nothing in between connects anything to anything. Yeah. Yeah. Therein lies your problem. There's no continuity. And I think, Mikey, what you're saying is the reason you can watch a 20-year-old show and have it be topical right. is because there's continuity. Am I there's right? A, Stone? You're, you know, and let me just talk about one other thing. You know, Vince gets thrown under the bus for a lot of things. And just recently, they had the Brawl for All, you know. So, guys, you know what oh, a yeah. big fan I was. I told you guys. The Brawl for All started on my birthday, okay? From the right. very first awkward fight, me and my bros knew this shit is real. We yeah. know what a fight is. And they ain't always pretty, okay? And so we're excited because we are going to find out who the toughest guy is. And there's some tough guys in here. All right, so... I'm a UFC fan. You might watch two or three UFC pay-per-views before yeah. you see anyone get their head knocked off. Like Bart Gunn started knocking people's heads off. You know, and when you see Bradshaw's head spin all the way around, yeah. the Godfather's head did the same thing, and guys were yeah. falling out of the ring. Don't tell me that wasn't entertaining, because we were going nuts. Oh, yeah. Shit. And, and, like uh, yeah. Go ahead, Mikey. And, on Tombstone's point, I'm actually very good friends with Vinny Pazienza, the boxer, who was I know the referee. Vinny well, sure. Vinny, Vinny was the referee oh. for the Butter Bean uh, Bart Gunn oh, fight. Right. Nice. At WrestleMania 15. So what I'll in Philadelphia, Angelo. So what I'll do? Yeah, uh, I know. The wrestling there. with with the wrestling with the future. The uh, yes, with the wrestling with the future uh, YouTube channel, I'll upload the interview I did with Vinny Paz. So that oh, your uh, yeah. Wrestling with the Future YouTube family can enjoy yeah. it. Because 
Paz talked about that fight and being the referee for that fight. Yeah, oh, I'd love to. Hear I'd, that. I would love to have Vinny Paz on the show. I'll work on that. Paz is a great guy. He he has a yeah. soft spot for wrestling, and yeah. a soft spot for a lot of things. But soft well, spot I got for a soft wrestling. spot for boxing too. So yeah, well, back I'm too. a boxing fan. Yeah, you could, um, well, I tell you what, guys, yeah. it's been a it's been a hell of a show. You know, I thought yeah. Magnum was going to give us about forty five minutes or an hour. He gave us an hour and 45 minutes. It's just so you guys guy. know. What he gave start. us an hour and 45. That's amazing. Thanks to you, and, Angelo, for putting it all and, together, buddy. Right. Yeah, and he, and he told me he's going he's gonna to come back. Great. Because um, we, we talked before the show. Um, well, I, what I want to do is go around the horn and have everybody plug their, uh, their merch. So, Tombstone, since you're the guest and you got the first and last questions, Plug Devotion, plug uh, Tombstone Beast. Appreciate Beach, plug it, guy. Appreciate it. Devotion Championship Wrestling. Get on YouTube. Um, it's a television show here locally in Utah. You can see it on the CW30. But around the world, just get on YouTube. Every one of those television shows get uploaded. There's stuff in the archives from back in 2019. It's been a company for a year. That's the other thing, guys. Just Well, now we're looking at about a year and a half. But before Vince got with us, we'd only been in a company in wrestling for a year. Yeah. And so to have Vince Russo working with us at this point, uh, you know, the owner, Manny Smith, Manny Lemons, I couldn't be more proud and uh, just happy to be part of this organization. That being said, Tombstone Jesus, friend me on Facebook or follow me, follow me on Instagram. And then, guys, before I was a wrestler, I was a little bit of a YouTube star. Get over to my YouTube channel and subscribe. You'll find wrestling. You'll find music. I am... I am the inventor, shall we say, of mountain metal. Okay, so we're yeah. like Leonard Skinner meets Motorhead. Uh -oh. yeah. I'm the singer, writer, play guitar, play bass. Check it out. And a lot of comedy on there, too. So check yeah. it all out. They call Tombstone Jesus the king of mountain metal. Mountain metal messiah. The yeah. mountain metal messiah. You're right. I'm sorry. You're right. Mountain no worries, metal messiah. Brother. Well, there was a lot to take in today, brother. There was a lot to take in. Hey, I tell <laughs> I you, a dream come true for me today, man. This this universe works in mysterious well, ways. Well, I so just want to tell you. everybody watching that, uh, you know, get used to seeing Tombstone Jesus on Wrestling with the Future because he's going to be back a lot. Good. Hell yeah. He's going to be back with us a lot. Mikey Messier. See that? Well, he's yeah. trying to <laughs> I, got, I got pencils for arms. <laughs> I, I, I would I would show my giant calves, but the camera won't have enough space to see my Rocky painting. <laughs> um, Them ramen noodles, look out! I'm yeah. telling you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to mention that uh, Nikita Bresnikov, a uh, good friend of the show, family, will be uh, talking with me on a special refs roundtable, Angelo, and we have a theme for the show. The theme will be something, uh, hypothetically, if the McMahons decide to sell the WWE, what would that mean for WWE itself and the rest of the pro wrestling world? Right. So like uh, we're going into the world of the hypothetical. There yeah. have been some rumors and innuendos, and we're not saying that this is happening. We're going into our speculation mode. Uh, Nikita and myself yeah. will be doing that tomorrow. Uh, life Excellent. lessons. Yes, Life Lessons with Mikey Messier continues. Four episodes in the can with more to come. You can see them on the Wrestling with the Future uh, YouTube channel as well as MikeMessier.com. And uh, Avalonia Festival is still accepting submissions of films. And there's a pro wrestling mm -hmm. film category, the Ox, uh, Nelson, and Dano category for three friends of mine. Ox Baker, Nelson Frazier Jr., known as Mabel or Big Daddy V., and Brian Danovich, the toughest man from Tough Enough 4. So for filmmakers out there, consider to enter Avalonia Festival. Terrific. And Dan, the man, Sebastiano. I just want to point out, uh, Tombstone, that uh, I think Mountain Metal Messiah, much better ring to it than Monday Night Messiah. So I think you got him beat on that one. 
Well, I've been Absolutely. claiming it for about 14 years, just so. Oh, you there know. you go. Got got a better, the better, better look and a better product. I like it. But uh, as for me, I'm I'm on Twitter, the man underscore wwtf, and uh, you see me on our YouTube channel, Wrestling with the Future. I got the rest of our videos uploaded this week, so we are yep. good to go. And uh, you're doing a hell of a job with our uh, Facebook group page, which is Wrestling with the Future. It's a private group. Um, you've got to answer some questions to join and be approved. And you're doing a hell of a job with that. And thank you for that. And Mike Messier you're doing an amazing job with our YouTube channel. Uh, Mikey is uh, in, in charge of our, I'm sorry, not our, uh, of the, um, I'll get it. Of the um, um, life's lessons with Mike Messier, he's been uploading uh, life lessons and some additional materials, and we will have some uh, some other wrestling related materials from Mike Messier. Um, of course, you know Dan, you you've got the YouTube channel that you've been working on a great job with it, and of course the uh, Wrestling with the Future group page. Um, we do have a public page also. It's facebook.com forward slash wrestling with the future. And that's open to everybody. You can uh, submit your uh, you know, questions, comments there. Uh, you can see, uh, you can still see some videos there. Um, but check them out while they're, while they're still there because they will be taken down shortly. Uh, we want everybody to go to our YouTube channel to watch the videos. We are on Twitter, and I know Mike Messier. You're taking care of our Twitter. Uh, I'm in the I'm in the mix, brother. I'm promoting the show and the videos on Twitter. Wrestling Future, W R E S T L I N mm -hmm. Future. If you just put Wrestling with the Future podcast, it'll show up with the uh, emblem, and the T-shirt's also available. <laughs> it Angela, sure will. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. And speaking of which, we've got merch. Got to yeah. plug our merch. Why not? Uh, Wrestling with the Future T-shirts, and I'll make sure I, I, I'm bleeding out in the in my my green screen here. Here we go. Move my microphone. Don't yeah. worry, folks. If you buy the shirt, the shirt comes in full, not in sections. <laughs> That's yeah, a exactly. good-looking shirt there. And Fun they are available in large, extra large, and two X, and special sizes. If you specify, we can make them as big as you want. And uh, let's see, we've got Wrestling with the Future Facebook. We've got, oh, submit your questions and comments, yeah. guest suggestions, Wrestling with the Future at gmail.com. You can reach us there. Um, you can reach out to Dan, Mike Messier. You can even reach out to Tombstone Jesus, and he'll uh, get you in contact with Devotion uh, or himself or us if you want. So uh, he's part of the family now, and you're going to be seeing a lot of them. So uh, on the on the downside of it now, we're pushing two hours and 30 minutes. So we're going to say good night, folks. Take care. Be safe. Happy wrestling, everybody. Bye-bye.